Bengaluru. India's Silicon Valley, the city has hundreds of lakes, but 90% of them are dangerously polluted with untreated sewage and industrial effluence. In the 1970s, there were still 285 lakes, but today there are just 190 odd lakes, and the large majority of them are dangerously polluted. When I was a child, there were over 1,020 ponds and lakes in Bangalore city and three perennial rivers. I'm talking about perennial water bodies. Today, there is no trace of these rivers. We don't even know where they are anymore. Everything is built upon. And only 82 lakes and ponds existing. Out of this, 44 of them are just sewage water. Only about 36 to 37 perennial water bodies have actual water, rest is all sewage. This has happened in forty years' time. This is what we are doing. This is the pressure of population. Human footprint has become so broad that there is no room for anything else to happen on this planet. As we have seen in India, many villages are completely empty now. People have moved away from the village because there is no water anywhere. Whole villages are gone. So this essentially means as water crisis progresses, more and more people will try to migrate to the city. If too many people migrate to the city where there is necessary infrastructure is missing, we will… we are looking at a very severe civil strife. We really fear what kind of civil strife can happen in the next twenty to twenty-five years in a country like India, unless we take corrective action today. This is the moment villagers wait for, sometimes for days, the arrival of a truck carrying a tank of water. The desperate scramble for one of life's most basic necessities. Women, men and children climb on top of the truck while it's still moving, afraid they might miss out on their share. बदल हो वाटते आम्हाला जे त्रास झालेला आहे ते आमच्या मुलांना आमच्या सुनाला आमच्या लेकीला कोणाला हो नाही त्रास आम्ही जास्त त्रास काढलाय विहिरीतून पाणी शेंदून काढायचं पुन्हा ते डोक्यावर घ्यायचं आणायचं त्याला साठवायला काही नव्हतं आता तरी ते येतेत बॅल बॅलर्स घेतलेत आता समजा तर ते थोडा बदल वाटला आणि ह्याच्यातून पण दुसऱ्या ठिकाणी गेलं तर तिथं जास्त बदल वाटतोय आणि आमचं गाव असं आडवळणे पडलेलं आहे when water becomes scarce, the first person who suffers most is the woman, always, in the rural societies. On an average, they're saying in the world, a whole lot of women, nearly about eight hundred million women, take six hours just to gather water for their family. Six hours. <laughs> I want you to just imagine, six hours of your life goes into just getting water. And obviously, when you have to carry water, all the beautiful things that water does to you and me on a daily basis, that will not be possible. Barely drink and make sure your children are fed or something like this, beyond that it will not go. So water shortages always hit the woman fast and then the others. So right now we are still in that state in this world, it is hitting the women very badly. Uh, men are still managing to drink a rack when there is no water, <laughs> you know. But that will go after some time, they will also suffer. Right now they think they have a solution in a bottle, but uh, that solution will go after a while. So what is the solution for this? See, one thing is agriculture. In India, agriculture consumes eighty-four percent of the river water. In the rest of the world, it averages somewhere around sixty-eight to seventy percent of the water is consumed by agriculture. In Europe, it's around twenty-five percent. In America, it's around forty percent. Why this is so is there is a distinct difference between nations which are located from zero to thirty-three degrees latitude and what is above. 
So generally whatever I speak is within thirty-three degrees latitude because here the precipitation is of a certain kind. For example, in India, the precipitation of the rain is approximately forty… forty-five to fifty days in a year on an average across the nation. The water that comes down in these forty-five days, we must have the ability to hold it in the land for three hundred and sixty-five days. This is where the real problem is. In Europe, the average rainfall and snowfall put together is about hundred and seventy days of precipitation. And there is an advantage with snow, it stays there and slowly melts down, giving time for the earth to absorb the water. But when it comes to heavy monsoon showers, if you don't have the necessary vegetation to hold it, the moment it comes, it's… it's a runoff. And the runoff causes enormous damage, both to the soil and agriculture and the lives of the people. Every year during monsoons, hundreds of people die because surprise runoffs will happen, that what you did not expect, that much flood will come all of a sudden. So the fundamental thing that we're aiming at is, we need more vegetation. We don't have enough vegetation for the number of people that we have right now. If you just fly over India, you look down, you will see entire India looks like brown desert. All rivers are drying up like this. Krishna is not touching the ocean almost four months. Kaveri, two and a half months to three months, it doesn't touch the ocean. When rain comes, it floods, otherwise there is nothing. A river which has flown for million years, in one generation if we kill it, Water scarcity in parts of Bihar's Laghi Sarai district is forcing people to literally dig up a river in search of water. The last four to five years, the river has been almost drying up. With dams, wells, as well as rivers drying up in Charkans, Jamtara. A time has come where how to exploit the water is gone, we need to see how to regenerate the river. The rivers in this nation are essentially forest-fed. Forest-fed river means precipitation happens, because of vegetation it is held and drop by drop it is let off, it becomes small rivulets and rivulets become streams, streams become rivers. So what do we have to do for this? It's very simple, for every major river, one kilometer on either side, there must be plantation. If it's government land, forest. If it's farmland, from regular farming to horticulture. Very easily, we can enhance the farmer's income three to eight times in a matter of four to six years' time. The farmer will need support, economic and material support to go through this period and come out as a prosperous farmer. What we call as a river is a source of water for the society, but it is not really a source of water. It is actually a destination for water. The only source of water we have in a tropical nation like ours is monsoon rains. Only four percent of our water comes from glacial sources, which are some Himalayan streams coming down. Even in the Ganga, the amount of glacial water is very minimal, rest is all forest-fed. What forest-fed means is, in our nation, on an average, somewhere between forty-five to sixty days, the rainfall happens. What comes down in approximately sixty days' time has to be stored in the land for three hundred and sixty-five days. The water should slowly go through its own process and slowly flow into rivers, tanks, wells and everything. But right now, because we have removed the vegetation in a major, major way, when I say major way, in the Ganga Basin, which is… which is accounting for twenty-five percent of India's geography and thirty-three percent of India's agriculture, we have removed ninety-two percent of the green cover in the last sixty years. Kaveri Basin, which is the home for about uh, eighty-five million people, we have removed eighty-seven percent of the green cover in the last fifty years. Every river is receding on an average forty percent, it has receded. Kaveri has receded about forty to forty-four percent in the last fifty years. Particularly in the south, it will happen much faster for a variety of reasons, I will not go into the entire science of it. Because of the nature of Deccan Plateau, it will happen that way. 
For uh, the, there is a Mohan here from Bangalore, I know this, forty years ago, if you dug five to ten feet in Bangalore city, water, you couldn't control water, it would just flow out. I… I had a farm, if I put bore well, without pump, without pump, water was always flowing out. This is how this region was, Mysore Bangalore region. Today it's all twelve hundred feet, bore wells. Which tree can put its roots to twelve hundred feet and get its water? So we must understand, this water that you're taking out from over thousand feet has been there for over million years, but we are exhausting it in a matter of six months, eight months, because the number of pumps which are sucking out is so big. So rivers are depleting because the aquifers are not charged. So this is not like a river is a separate thing, a lake is a separate thing, a well is a separate thing, there is no such thing in a tropical climate. These are all one water system. The science of hydrology is such that if you do not hold the water in the soil, then it will flow off. When you… F when it flows, it also takes away the surface water. So the only way is to increase green cover. There is no question of increasing forest because the population pressure is so big. The only way we can go ahead is agroforestry, horticulture and tree-based agriculture, essentially. Six hundred million Indians, that's nearly half the population, are facing acute water shortages. Despite India's economic growth in recent years, it remains one of the most unequal societies in the world, and that inequality can be seen in people's access to life's most basic necessity, water. 300,000 farmers have killed themselves in the past 25 years and many more have deserted their crops to move to cities in search of work, leaving behind the elderly. Uh, have you seen uh, older uh, Tamil movies or even Hindi movies where village women are carrying big pots on their head and walking water and the hero comes and sings a song? and she also sings a song and romance happens, there she danced with the pot on her head. You seen these things? Well, that is because the actress is carrying an empty pot <laughs> But the real woman in the village is carrying a pot which weighs fifteen to twenty kilograms on her head. Nobody sings to her and she cannot even open her mouth. She's shaking all this. Have you seen them? Hello? With twenty kilograms on her head, her neck and her head, everything is shaking with stress. She's not going to sing a song, she's not going to fall in love with anybody on the street. She just wants to take the damn pot and put the water in the house because her children and her husband and her family, whatever, for them. You thought it's romantic when a a rural person carries a pot full of water on her head or on his head. But today that you have to carry a pot on your head, it's come, time has come. Now you think it's a crisis, wonderful to your humanity, fantastic sense of humanity. I'm glad you're getting the point. Because water distress has been there in rural India for a very long time, I want you to understand this. Only when it comes to urban centers, now we're thinking it's a real crisis. No, most of the population is in rural India. The crisis has always been there, isn't it? In the last twenty-five, thirty years, there's been a serious crisis. 
Well, now it's come to Chennai, at least now you're at least willing to talk about it, I'm glad. These pictures are from Chennai, one of India's largest cities. It didn't just wake up to dry taps. Chennai has been gradually losing water because of two reasons, low rainfall and depletion of underground water reservoirs. Chennai is not the only Indian city with this problem. 21 major cities in India, including the capital Delhi, could run out of water as early as next year. That's according to the National Institution for Transforming India. Bengaluru, once called the city of lakes, is expected to become the next city to run dry. Tamil Nadu and its capital city are struggling to meet the water demand of its citizens. The Indian farmer, they say, is born in debt, lives in debt and dies in debt. A harsh truth closer home in Karnataka, which is at the brink of a crisis in one of the most fertile regions of the state, the Kaveri Belt. In Kaveri Basin, in the last ten years, 47,192 farmers have committed suicide in this Kaveri Basin, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu. What more do you want, I'm asking? What does it take to wake you up? Where is the humanity, I'm asking? In this country, in the last fifteen years, over three hundred thousand, three lakh farmers have committed suicide. We've had four wars, three with Pakistan, one with China. In all these four wars, on both sides, three hundred thousand people did not die. They did not. That many numbers did not die, though we think a war is a great disaster. What is it that you need? You want people to hang in front of your home or in your bedroom? Only then you will respond. What is it? See, we need to understand this. River, river, lake, pond, well are not sources of water. They are only destinations for water. The only and only and only source of water in this country is monsoon. I want this to sink into the young people. Well, those in central India have to walk for miles to get their glass of water. We have a population of 1.3 billion people. I want you to just look at this possibility. No water, 1.3 billion people. The civil strife that will happen, what will happen to human beings when there is no water to drink, you can forget about humanity, something else will take force. Every human being consumes water, air, everything else, food, land, all of us consume, there's no choice about it. But when it comes to doing compensatory action, very few people are doing it. This is the disaster on the planet. Something so fundamental as water, if rivers stop flowing, large tracts of India will turn into graveyards. If we don't do the right things in the next ten years, fifteen years time, it could be too late. So, this doesn't happen overnight. This has been happening. Chennai people never thought it's a problem. Till they have to wait for a train to bring water, huh? Southern India, a tropical nation, rich land, fertile land, which we have farmed for over twelve, fifteen thousand years. Over twelve thousand year history of farming in this land. Same land we plowed for twelve thousand years and every year it gave us the yield. But in two generations, in about approximately forty years since we started using chemical fertilizer, now nearly twenty-five percent is on the verge of becoming a desert. The entire land of India is approximately around hundred and sixty million hectares of arable land. Out of this, one hundred and four million hectares of arable land is right now considered as distressed soil. That means nearly fifty-five to sixty percent of India's land in twenty-five, thirty years' time will be uncultivable. And we have… by then we will be one point five billion people. Tch, what a great plan to have one point five billion people and lose sixty percent of the land. How are you going to keep them alive? When I spoke about eight years ago, 
that, dead bodies will fall. People said, Sadhguru, don't talk like this. I said, okay, wait. You wait, it will fall. Not in ones and twos or dozens, it will fall in thousands if you don't wake up in millions. The city has entered a phase where it is anticipated the real possibility of day zero. Cape Town's flirtation with day zero brought the apocalyptical future promised by Hollywood producers crashing into our realities. And last month, Shimla gave India its own Cape Town moment. But according to the latest report by Niti Aayog, this is just the tip of the iceberg. With 75% of households still without access to drinking water at their premises, India is ranked 120th out of 122 countries on the Quality of Water Index. Today, 600 million Indians are living under extreme water stress. This means they are unable to meet their human and ecological demand for fresh water. The top government planning agency, Niti Aayog, says India is suffering from the worst water crisis in its history. I can guarantee you the 99.99% probability at least five to six important cities in India will face zero water day because of continued mismanagement. Without changing the chemical composition of the water, you can rearrange the molecular arrangement in such a way that the water will behave completely in a different way than the way it does. To such an extent, it's sensitive to this extent that if I take a glass of water in my hand and just look at it in a certain way and give it to you, well-being will come to you. If I look at it another way and give it to you, you will fall sick tonight. This is no more superstition, this is science. So is there any scientific evidence? There's substantial scientific evidence today about how the molecular structure of the water can be rearranged without changing the chemical structure, even with a simple thought or a touch. The, f the problem is, your grandmother told you this, didn't she? Didn't your grandmothers tell you, you should not drink water from anybody's hand, do not take food from anybody, there is a certain way, you must receive only if they have good intentions for you. Did they tell you these things? But when your grandmother said it, the problem is if it goes from the east, it is superstition. If it comes from the west, it becomes science. Today there is substantial scientific evidence to show that water has tremendous memory. If you just generate a thought, looking at the water, the molecular structure of the water will change. Just a look, the molecular structure of the water will change. If you touch it, it will change. How you touch it is very important. So now for example, they're keeping it in a copper vessel with a flower on top of it, because this is the god. What other god? If you don't drink water for one, one day, this is the only god. No other god, <laughs> isn't it? So, how you treat the water, the memory remains for a long period. So before we consume it or before it touches our body, how we treat the water changes the quality of everything in our system. This is a science we have always known, but today modern science has done enormous amount of experimentation on this. Now they're saying water is a liquid computer. The volume of memory and intelligence is carries by itself. It is a liquid computer, this is what they're saying, it's a fluid computer. We have always known this. The so-called modern life has absolutely no reverence to the substances which make our life. The life-making material is being treated badly and we're expecting it'll behave well within us and it will not. So being here at Narmada, it's time we bring back this culture because it's gone a full circle. Now modern science is insisting that water, the way you treat it is the way it's going to behave within you. And we must learn to treat it well. If we want to be healthy, if we want to be well, if we want to be successful, if we want to be prosperous, for all these things it's important, the elements within you cooperate. If they don't cooperate, nothing will work. So the water today, 
We know about this in so many ways in India, Tirth. In every temple there's a Tirth because water is capable of memory and intelligence. Today much research has gone into this. Every molecule of uh, water, water molecules which gather and make into water cells, they have a phenomenal capability to remember things. Everything that happens around the water, it remembers. Everything that it comes in contact with, it remembers. It is alive. It is alive and intelligent. Water behaves just about the same way as human nervous system behaves. If you… if you take this water and just look at it with a certain emotion, immediately the molecular structure will change. If you look at it with a different kind of emotion, it will change differently. It is no more your grandmother talk. In, even today in traditional southern Indian homes, if you go and see, water is kept like a deity, understand? With vibhuti, with sacred ash smeared on it and properly worshipped every day, it is worshipped before you drink because we've always been conscious that water has memory and if it has memory of the right things, it will do the right things within you. If it has memory of the wrong things, it will do wrong things within you. This may be very controversial, the medical fraternity will for sure protest on this, but uh, they will come to it after maybe twenty years or thirty years. <laughs> I would say if everybody consumes good water in sufficient quantity, fifty percent of the heart attacks in the world would come down. The damage to the heart is immense when the water that is needed is not there in the system. But when I say water, it is not just about drinking liquid water. You must eat high water content foods. If you eat a fruit, it's nearly ninety percent water. Vegetables and other things are over seventy percent water. Minimum seventy percent water content must be there in the food that you eat. In a South Indian jungle, a lion was really feeling a little, you know, the king of the jungle. So he was just swaggering around like that, he saw a little rabbit, pop, he caught him. Who is the king of the jungle? he asked. <laughs> you know, you don't know whether you are a snack today? Said, you, you, my master, only you, who else can be? Let him go, okay, magnanimous today. And then a fox was going, pop, he caught the fox. Who is the king of the jungle? You know a fox, what he will say. He said all those things with extra attachments. Then he was feeling really full and with a big swagger he came. There was a big clearing in the forest. He looked up to the huge tusca. He was in the mood, not considering sizes. He said, who is the king of the jungle? The tusca, without a word, picked him up in his trunk, twirled him around and smashed him on the ground, his back broke. Then he said, you could have just told me <laughs> The Tusker said, well, I had to make my point. <laughs> Life is just like this. <laughs> you… after things go bad, well, you could have told me, I would have loud water. Tch, somebody should have told me <laughs> No. <laughs> Yeah, your life has to make a point, otherwise not everybody gets it. <laughs>